It's a real pleasure to be here. I always enjoy getting to give talks with diverse audiences where it's not just one set of people with one set of you know, conceptions about how things work, but really a diverse group. So I'm also looking forward to your questions and your feedback afterwards. So um, today I'm gonna talk about a small section of my work on cancer, which is about using evolutionary theory to better understand why cells evolve to move, why they evolve to invade neighboring tissues, and eventually evolve to basically colonize the whole body. And how can we use evolutionary theory and ecological theory to better understand what's going on, and then potentially to develop treatments that capitalize on the tools and knowledge that we can derive from evolutionary theory. So I'm going to tell you first a little bit more about the Center for Evolution and Cancer at UCSF. Carlo gave you a small introduction to that, but I want to make sure that all of you know that there are opportunities for you to potentially get involved with things that we have going on and to attend our conference, et cetera. And then I'll, I'll talk to you about my work on the evolution of metastasis. So at the CEC, we focus on really trying to understand what are the fundamental evolutionary dynamics that drive the various processes that Carlo talked about. And this, it's so important to be creating a platform in which evolutionary biologists and cancer biologists can talk because there's so much knowledge that cancer biologists have about how their system works that evolutionary biologists don't have. So if evolutionary biologists are going to make an impact on the field of cancer biology, there, has, there have to be good ways of information sharing. So part of what we're trying to do is create a platform for that. And we hope that this will allow for evolutionarily informed approaches to cancer research, cancer prevention, and also to patient management. So the main areas of research at the CEC are cancer suppression. So how do organisms evolve? to suppress cancer? How um, does neoplastic progression, the process of getting cancer, how is that governed by evolutionary dynamics? How about therapeutic resistance? So Carlo talked extensively about that. How do the evolutionary dynamics underlying therapeutic resistance, um, uh, how can we use evolutionary theory to better address the evolution of therapeutic resistance? And then finally, the two areas that I um, work in mostly are social evolution and human evolution. So we're applying those ideas and areas as well. So for just a little more insight into some of the specific projects we have going on, um, cancer suppression is a complex problem, obviously, um, but it's one that organisms have had to solve since the dawn of multicellularity. In order to create a multicellular body, you have to suppress the proliferation of individual cells. So if we consider the wider problem of how do organisms create and maintain multicellular bodies, that may give us some insights in how humans pr um, suppress cancer. So um, Carlo has a few projects on that, uh, so I encourage you to talk to him about it, ask him what Peto's paradox is if you want to have an interesting conversation. Neoplastic progression, Carlo talked about this um, quite a bit, that progression to malignancy occurs because of natural selection. And cells acquire these hallmarks of cancer that allow them to outcompete neighboring cells. So this is basically you know, cells that were selected to be good members of a multicellular community and promote the fitness of the organism, um, becoming selfish and promoting their own fitness at the expense of the cells around them. And then finally, therapeutic resistance. Um, when we treat cancer, we're selecting for the cells that are best able to survive in the environment that includes the therapy. And we don't necessarily want to be doing that. And then finally, social evolution in cancer, applying social evolutionary theory to cancer is really about sort of taking a paradigm and a set of tools from um, game theory and other related fields and saying, how can we use this framework to 
ask the right questions and develop the right models for testing some of our theories initially and then bringing that in to um, testing in vitro and in vivo. So in order to get a sense of why social evolution is relevant, it's important to, to take a sort of step back and think about cancer cells not as just these, you know, sort of automatons that are doing what their genes say, but they are dynamically responding to their environment, to the cells that are next to them, and to the extent that cells are changing what they're doing, cancer cells are changing what they're doing based on what the cells around them are doing, you're going to get selection on basically the social behavior of those cancer cells. So we can apply a lot of the same principles from social evolutionary theory that have been used to understand organismal evolution and how organisms evolve to cooperate with their neighbors or compete with them, and apply that to understand how cells evolve to do things that might benefit their neighbors or impose costs on their neighbors. So I'll talk to you in a couple minutes about one, uh, one example of how we can apply social evolutionary theory to um, cancer, which is to understand how resource competition influences the evolution of dispersal. Final area for the Center for Evolution in Cancer is human evolution in cancer. So how is it that our understanding of human evolution can inform cancer research? Well, evolution has shaped our bodies. and our bodies are made up of cells that eventually turn cancerous, and we both have the susceptibility to cancer within our body and also the defenses against cancer. And we've been shaped by a you know, variety of trade-offs between somatic investment, that's sort of investing in keeping your body functioning well, um, and reproducing. So all organisms face this sort of trade-off. And there's some growing evidence that cancer may actually be a result of a favoring of that trade-off towards reproduction with less somatic investment. So that's an exciting area. Um, it may be that the very flexible neural architecture of our brains uh, may predispose us to having cells that can be more creative. That's a, a possibility that hasn't been explored, but I think it's uh, worth exploring in a little more depth. Um, and then finally, there are some sort of more psychological aspects of our evolutionary history that are quite relevant to cancer um, and cancer prevention and cancer treatment. So one is our predisposition towards obesity and smoking. Those are actually based in our evolutionary history. So if we can understand better what are the cues from the environment that result in overeating, that result in smoking, we may be able to better prevent cancer. And then finally, we may have biases about cancer that affect the way we approach it as researchers and affect the way we treat it. So Carlo made reference to this um, project that we're doing to look at why has evolution not been used in the cancer, uh, in cancer research, and we suspect that part of it may be that people have biases towards thinking about cancer as a sort of unitary essentialist entity that has a nature rather than thinking about the heterogeneity and the dynamic nature of cancer. And a bias like that can definitely influence the kinds of um, research questions that are asked, the kinds of tools that are used. Are you actually using tools where you can see if there's underlying heterogeneity or not? Um, and uh, it's definitely of interest to us how these kinds of biases may be affecting treatment as well. So. For example, does ha using a war metaphor for cancer lead to more aggressive treatment than using uh, an alternative metaphor? So finally, um, the last thing I want to tell you about the CEC is about the education and outreach activities. So one of the important goals of the center is to increase the visibility of evolution in cancer as a field, not just within academia, um, but also to the larger outside world. So in order to do that, um, Carlo's given some public lectures, including one at Arizona State University, um, for the larger community that's really aimed at educating. Um, and also for all uh, levels of students who may be going on to medicine, including undergraduates. We're also working with the Understanding Evolution website to develop uh, educational materials 
uh, on evolution in cancer. And we're hoping that we'll be able to combine that in effective ways with our projects for understanding the barriers to evolutionary thinking. We're working at UCSF to try to add some more evolutionary reasoning into the cancer section um, in the, the main course for medical students. And then Carlo mentioned the conference, the International Biannual Evolution and Cancer Conference. So our conference last year was a great success. We brought together some of the world's leading theoretical biologists with cancer researchers um, and just sort of a small um, group of speakers, sort of like three days worth of today. And a really large community of cancer researchers from UCSF came and listened and were interested and started to talk with theoreticians about what they might be able to do differently. So this was a really great success for us and we're looking forward to um, next summer having our second annual uh, Evolution in Cancer Conference. And the focus of this one is going to be on applying insights from microbial evolution to understanding evolution in cancer. So how does how do the things that we know about the way single-celled organisms evolve, how can we apply those insights to understanding evolution in cancer better, including the social evolution dimension, of which there is lots of work now um, starting in, on microbes to understand their social evolution. So on to the second half of the talk. As all of you know, metastasis and invasion of neighboring tissues is a really huge issue. In fact, it is the issue in cancer. The tumor growth itself is not necessarily deadly unless um, you're blocking blood vessels or if you have a tumor in the brain, the tumor growth can be a problem. But most of the time, it's not the size of the tumor that's the problem. It's the fact that the cells evolve to invade neighboring tissues and eventually metastasize in the body. As long as the tumor is encapsulated, it can be huge and not be a problem. Uh, one of the other issues that you have with metastasis is that you can't actually remove it. So treatment is much more limited. And because metastatic cells get into all these systems of the body, they can disrupt many systems of the body. In fact, we still don't really understand why most patients die of cancer. Something happens when all those cells go everywhere, stuff gets dysregulated, um, and it's really the actual mechanisms for what kills you of cancer, we don't really know. I think often people act like they know, or they use phrases that imply that they know, but we don't really know why people die of cancer. So then we can ask the question, well, how can we control metastasis? So how can we perhaps push things so that we don't have as much metastasis? And I'm gonna argue that the key to really understanding how we can control metastasis, control invasion, may lie with evolutionary theory and ecological theory. So why should we be applying these principles? Well, as Carlo, I think, argued, it's, it's the same underlying dynamics that occur with organismal evolution. There's variation in populations that's heritable, there's selection on those variants, there's differences in fitness, and this, these same fundamental dynamics are occurring in the body. So your body is this ecosystem your organs have you know, different levels of different factors and different amounts of immune cells in them and all sorts of things that create what's essentially a diverse set of ecologies inside your body. And cancer cells are evolving in, at first, just one ecology, and then as they start to invade neighboring tissues and metastasize, they're evolving to potentially be successful in multiple ecologies, or they're evolving to be adapted to their particular ecology. So it's really a, a system where we can take insights from ecological theory and evolutionary theory and apply them in a way that makes sense. So in particular, dispersal theory is relevant to metastasis. So the main idea behind dispersal theory is that when there's resource limitation, that selects 
for individuals who can leave the area where environment where the resources are limited. And one of the corollaries of this is that if you have a phenotype that's highly exploitative, you're using lots of resources, that's going to lead to selection for dispersal because you're creating an environment that's not as good. And what's interesting here is that you have many um, feedback loops with evolution because once you have the evolution of dispersal, that can also then select for other traits like, for example, more exploitation of your environment. So there's some really interesting dynamics here that are informed by decades of research on dispersal in organisms. So a couple of things to consider about cancer cells and their use of resources. We know that normal cells are programmed to use resources and divide in a way that promotes the fitness of the organism. So they don't take up more than they really need. They don't divide unless it's a good thing for the whole organism. Um, but cancer cells are different. So they use resources quickly. They create more waste products. They replicate more quickly. Um, they recruit blood vessels to provide resources. They suppress the immune system, they invade the bloodstream, and colonize new regions. So they're really these you know, users of resources that kind of get out of control. And it's very likely that many pre-malignant tumors are self-limiting because they're constrained by resources. And it's only once they evolve sort of to get out of those checks and balances of being a multicellular cell that they can start using more resources and um, getting out of control. And finally, these issues of competition over resources and resource use change the selective environment that cells are in. So that can lead to unanticipated effects like selection, for example, for cell motility. So I'm gonna show you just briefly some results from a recent paper we had in cancer prevention research um, that models how resource use affects the evolution of cell motility. So within tumors, there are a wide variety of limiting resources that include oxygen, glucose, phosphorus, et cetera. Um, so we ask, does high resource use lead to selection for modal cells? Um, cells can move in a variety of ways. It's actually quite fascinating um, how many ways cells are capable of, of moving. Um, but we know that they are indeed able to move and also that hypoxia, the lack of oxygen, um, induces cell motility. So there's all sorts of conditional responses that these cells are able to use. Um, but the first thing that we wanted to do was just model the evolution of probabilistic movement. So how likely is it um, that a cell moves in a given time step? And how does that change based on the resource use of the cell? So we constructed an agent-based model where each microenvironment had resource renewal, which you could think of as resource delivery through a capillary, and some amount of diffusion. And we varied the pace of resource use of the cells and then looked at the rate of motility that evolved. And what we found is if we just um, made a population of individuals that had higher relative consumption rates um, to what was available on the patch, that the rate of motility evolved to be much higher. Um, and if we put in normal cells with those sort of neoplastic cells that consume too quickly, what we found is that the normal cells um, remained at the initial motility rate, um, while the uh, cancer cells evolved to have higher rates of motility. So there are a lot of basic questions in the evolution of metastasis that we don't know the answer to. So I mentioned a few of the limiting resources in cancer, like oxygen, glucose, phosphorus. We don't really know what the limiting resources are, whether there are many others, um, to what extent each of those resources is limiting, if they're different limiting resources in different sort of local ecologies, i.e. in different organ systems. Um, and whether that the limiting resources change as cancer progresses. We, don't, we also don't know much about how resource dilemmas are shaping the evolution of metastasis and how social evolutionary processes other than resource use might be important. Um, we don't know if the selection for dispersal then creates selection for more aggressive cells. I think it's quite likely given what we know about evolutionary theory, but it has not yet been tested. And we also don't know how selection for cell motility interacts with selection for other 
abilities, like the capacity to use angiogenic signaling to recruit more blood vessels. So you may be sort of improving your environment by recruiting more blood vessels to deliver resources. Um, but if you're using resources at a high rate, you may also be selected to leave your environment. So I think there's some complicated dynamics which we can understand if we really take evolutionary theory and ecological theory seriously when trying to understand tumors and um, evolution of tumors. So I'm going to actually stop here and uh, sh just uh, recognize my um, various collaborators. So John Pepper and um, Carlo Maley were important parts of uh, the dispersal evolution project. And um, Aurora Nadalku is a very important part of our center and um, a couple of grants that have really helped us do this work. So I think with that, I'll uh, give the mic again to Randy. And thank you all very much.